Thank you. Thank you. Again, my name is Joel Williams. I'm originally from Kinston, North Carolina. If you're anybody familiar with that, which is eastern part of the state. Yeah, we know some of my people out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, overall, I want to thank you for inviting me, Jane. Thank you. Uh, my wife and I are going to go golfing today, so we're going to run out after I finish talking to you. Uh, but success, I'm going, to, I'm going to walk through a little bit here as to what I found over the years, okay? Now, I grew up in a neighborhood where we were fighting every day. We were hustlers. We did a lot of things that were not considered legal. But in our community, it was acceptable. It was the way of the land. And so in the eighth grade, growing up the only child, my mother who worked at a shirt factory, my stepfather was a police officer. In the eighth grade, I walked up to my parents and I said, today is the last day you have to buy me anything. I'm going to work full time. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to provide for myself. And they looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. Now, what in the world is this eighth grade kid making this kind of statement for? In my mind, as I look back on it now, that is the age where usually young men want to be accountable, want to be responsible for themselves. And so that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to have success in taking care of myself. I wanted to have my own car. I wanted to be able to take my girlfriend out to dates. I wanted to be able to, to actually have some kind of control over my life. And so went to college, did a lot of things I should not have done, and, and had some form of success coming out of college and corporate. Went to Ford Motor Company in Detroit, which is where I met my wife. Did well in that, hated it, but I did extremely well in it. And I wanted to own my own businesses, because I knew that if you, whoever you worked for, you were a slave to. And so I knew I wanted to own, I always knew that, that I wanted to be in a position of being able to hire, that I wanted to sign the front of the check and not the back of it. I knew that. And so the process to get there, what I consider to be successful, was the houses, the money, the cars, the stuff. And had some success going to buying dealerships in the to take that. So the success that I thought was success was, okay, I'm a millionaire. I got the houses, the big homes. I had the wife and the children and the cars and, and the reasonable sized bank account. And the lies that I had been told coming up in life was that that was what success was. As a matter of fact, they would say it this way, especially churches so, oh, you're blessed. You were boy, you're blessed with the house, and you're blessed. Because even fools identify success with stuff. And so I kept seeing this, I'm successful, but every night I was in my mind saying, this doesn't equal to any happiness. Then why am I miserable? Then why am I not, I'm not able to enjoy this? And so I discovered something. I discovered that success is not tied to necessarily what you want to accomplish. Those are, that's part of it, but that's not true success. True success is an understanding of who you are. See, it changes up the dynamic of things. When you say you want to be successful, you say, well, I want to score a touchdown, or I want to have a nice home and provide for my family. That sounds good, and to some extent it's okay. But that's a far different mindset than saying, I am a man. Because when you say, I am a man, then what's by product of being a man is providing for your family, is accomplishing things, is setting the tone, but it also includes influencing others. The most powerful thing that you can have with being a man is your influence, that you set the tone, that you lead, that you also reach out to those who are less fortunate, that you reach out and help pull them up and show them a pathway, which is what this team of people are doing for you. They're helping to show you a path. In many cases, some of the best lessons are the paths not to take. I can teach you those. I can teach you how to make mistakes, how to get in trouble, how to spend a day in jail. I can tell you those things, too. How to almost be bankrupt. I can tell you how to do those things, too. It's not just in our success that you learn more than anything. It's in our perceived failures where we learn the most. So with that, success, by the way I'm going to define it, is not what you think it is. Take it from me. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what it is. Have you ever seen a, let's say, for example, a Ford Taurus? Ford Taurus on the road. You're seeing somebody drive a Ford Taurus. I used to own a car dealership, a couple Ford and Buick uh, franchises up north and down south here. And so, but I was a corporate guy with Ford Motor Company. The, the Ford Taurus that you see on the road, let's say, what, what do you drive? What, what kind of car do you drive? All right, so let's the Mountaineer, which is actually made by Ford Motor Company. If you were to see him driving the Mountaineer and you say to him, that's a nice looking Mountaineer, he said, yes, sir, absolutely. The problem is the Mountaineer that he is driving today 
is not the mountaineer that was created in the beginning. In the beginning, there's something called a concept vehicle. You may see that in some automotive magazines. That's the vehicle that has all the bells and whistles. It has edges to it that most people couldn't imagine seeing on the road. It is the creative intention of the chief engineers. But what happens to the mountaineer, like any other vehicle, they take that and they show it to the people, and the people are in awe of how beautiful it is. Oh, man, when that comes out, I'm going to want one of those. But by the time it gets to being produced, mass produced, it's not the same vehicle. What happens is they bring it in a room with marketing and sales people and, and other design people and people from all different departments, and they then say, no, the people will not accept it that way. It has too much on it, too fast, or it's too powerful. So let us chop it up. Let's take this off and let's take that off. And by the time it gets to you, it is a revised version. The problem is, is if I don't know what the mountaineer and it was intentional, look like and intentionally created for, I'll make the mistake of thinking what he's driving is the real deal. That's the same thing that's happened with man. Over time, people have told you what you could not do. Parents, worship center leaders, educators, TV, and everything else have told you something different than who you really are. The only thing you need to know is your creator if you want to know who you are. The one who created you had something in mind when he created you. And he had in mind a result that was going to give him what he intended. The challenge is, do you know what that is? Do you begin everything with the end in mind? Do you know what he intended when he created man? If you don't, all the other stuff is play play and good, good dialogue. If in your conversation you have not determined that you were created to rule and have dominion, then you're falling short of what the mountaineer was supposed to be. If anything about you says you're to just blend in and just accomplish my particular goal, you're still missing it. Because man was not created to just accomplish a particular goal. Man was created to rule and have dominion on the earth. And if you don't understand that, and most of us don't, I'm just coming into the recognition of that more and more every day. You're going to equate success with stuff and goals and not with identity. The beautiful thing about Jesus the Christ is that he knew who he was. He didn't try to cater it to us or to the Pharisees or anyone else. So matter of fact, his response was, I am. The same response as the father when he gave his information to Moses. Who shall I say sent me? He says, first tell them I am sent you. The best thing you could ever learn is to be able to respond to the question of who you are. I am man. And because I am man, I love one woman. I don't need more than one. I provide for her, protect her, love her, have fun with her, lead her. I am man, so what do I do with my children? Does man disown his children? Does it? Does man look for someone else to give him stuff? I am man. And so I, I challenge you, and this is the most difficult thing that I've ever done, and I've seen men, thousands of them around the country struggle with this. Some of the most popular, the most Christian men you could ever meet don't have a clue to their identity as to who they are. If you don't know the answer to that, your adversary, Satan, is going to have a butt kicking contest with you. He will challenge everything about you, even your so called success, if you don't know who you are. I promise you. And once you come into knowing who you are, and you don't have to be 50 and 40 to learn that, matter of fact, it's better you learn it now then everything you do unapologetically should reflect that I am man. Man being, being male and female created in the image and the likeness of the us and our of Genesis 126. When you get that part down, I don't have to tell you to pull your pants up. 
because a man doesn't walk that way. See, you see, I can either tell you who you are, or I can tell you what to do and what not to do. Which one do you prefer? Which one do you prefer? Oh, oh. Who are you? Because then I don't have to tell you what to do and what not to do. I just say, follow me. Success is not something we're experiencing in the land today. Our boys are dying on every street corner in America. Is that not true? Filling up prisons every day. Filling them up, and most of them on average have three children. What are we winning? What have we won? Seventy-some percent of our children of color have no father in the house. What have we won? The amount of businesses owned today by us is little to nothing compared to every other group out there. In cities like where I grew up in, you have 20 to 1 worship centers versus businesses. What are we winning? There's not one Fortune 500 company started by someone that looks like you. That's real. So what's fun? What's funny? What have we accomplished? We don't need you to just go looking for a good job. No. We need you to own it. You understand? Every business you ride by, someone owns it. And if I'm a betting man, it's not you. That has to change. You have to influence politics, education, through business, everything that you do, media, you have to change how it's affecting culture. And if it's not going to be you guys, I don't know who it's going to be. So I'm going to challenge you to be who you are. And then I'm going to hold you accountable to that. I want to know what your season, what territory you decided to take over. What neighborhood, what single mothers, what widows, I want to know what schools you have decided that you're going to bring a change to. If not, I'm not talking to men. I'm talking to kids who don't know who they are. I expect you to lead. Our community needs you to lead now. To win now. Success is doing and being what he created you to be and do. Nothing short of that. Do you understand? I don't need you entertaining me. With your basketball or with your rap or with your dance. When a king wants to be entertained, who does he call in? The clown. I am a king. I don't need you to entertain me. I need you to rule. Anything less than that, you're falling in line with what the Satan wants. We don't have time to be entertained anymore. I thank you for showing up today. But that's not enough. You gotta leave. You gotta be a man. Now, Last thing, and I end it with this. David, the king, who I love, is a fighter. <coughs> I'm a fighter. I grew up fighting. I love boxing. I love contact. Before David died, he calls his son into the room, Solomon. Has anybody ever heard of Solomon? The wisest man ever, correct? This is what he says to his son while on his deathbed. David says to Solomon, Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Not all the other fluff. He said to his son, prove yourself a man. That's my challenge to you. Prove yourself. I, I knew that I wasn't like everyone else around me early. So I never fit into their model. I was always very popular. I always had the prettiest girl. I always wanted to make money. A lot of different ways, and I don't recommend those ways. <laughs> But I know but the ball breaks loose, my wife know I still know how to do what I have to do. Right? There's some confidence in knowing that if all hit breaks loose, you still know how to do what you need to do. Fair? 
All right, so with that, success comes in different stages. Now, the thing that, that I learned was what I considered to be successful about other people telling me was the lie. So they said you're successful because you're making millions. Like well, what it is, is this, they bought into the lie themselves. So this is the impression that they would actually get. They would actually tell you that everyone that lives near me in these big homes, they actually make you believe that that's success. But the people that live in the big homes are on drugs more than the people are in the hood. Cooked on pornography, cooked on all kinds of stuff, adultery at the highest of levels. But we can hide it behind the big picket fence and the big homes. So success, and, and so that's the other side who doesn't have that stuff says they're successful. And these that have this stuff are saying, but why am I miserable? It doesn't change anything. Matter of fact, money exposes holes. So success comes from only when you find out who you are. Simon Barjona, son of Barjona, thought his name was Simon. He walked with a man named Jesus for three years being called Simon. It's not until Jesus asked him a question. He said, who do people say that I am? And they told him, and then he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus looks at him and says, for flesh and blood didn't give you that. That came directly from the Father himself. Now let me introduce you to who you are. Your name is Peter, the rock. Success only will come when you come in a true awareness of who Christ is. Because it locked in his mouth is your identity, your new name. Not in your worship and attendance, your denomination and all the other foolishness. It is only in when you come into a knowledge which can only be revealed by the Father himself as to who Christ is. Then you'll know why he was sent to restore you back to who you are. That's the only success you should ever desire. Anything outside of that is play play. If you were drunk when you were poor, you're going to be a drunk when you got money just drinking better liquor. <laughs> Can anybody tell you otherwise? They lie. <laughs> if your wife won't cook and worth nothing in the little apartment, she ain't gonna cook and worth nothing in the mansion. If you were hooked on pornography in the hood, you're gonna be hooked on it at the country club. Anyone that tells you otherwise, they're lying. Only success is only identified when you come into the knowledge of who you are, and that is only through Jesus Christ. An intimate relationship with, with the Father by way of Christ. That's it. When you get that, then you become man. That's success. That's when you'll know it. That's when I've come to learn to walk in it. And it's an evolving process. Any, anything else? I, I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, talk about, I heard you mention influence. There's a power of influence. So we got these young men coming up. Tell us about. Who influenced you in that book or your inner circle of influence when you were Influence growing up, we're all the cool guys, we're all the cool ones. The best influence that I've ever had is two men that I can attest that have more imprint on my success than anyone. One is Larry Titus. Larry Titus mentors men. He loves men. You walk into a room with him, all of a sudden within five minutes, a thousand men in the room want to hug him and don't know why. <laughs> he just being honest with you, right? Because his gift is truly that of fathering men. And for Larry Titus, you should pull him up. And so what Larry did is show me how to be a father and a husband. How to walk it out. That's one. Number two, Fred Beans. Fred Beans is a businessman. If a check right fight broke out, he'd win. Fred is as close to a billionaire as you could get if he's not there already. Fred taught me how to be a king. And how to be a king maker. He is the first to show me discipleship. I grew up in a worship center my whole life. Never saw discipleship, which is contrary to what Jesus told us to do and what he did. Fred discipled men, and my success came from applying what he showed me how to do. Those two men influenced me. Any success I have from business or in family, I attribute to those two men who would attribute to their, their principles learned in their relationship with the Father. Money ain't worth two dollars if you have no influence. I'd rather have influence than money. Because influence, I can pick up a phone and get done what your money cannot do. Influence. You understand? You ever played the game of chess before? Let me give you what chess really means. This is what the Lord gave me one day. 
The game of chess is you playing against your adversary. Their design, I'm going to change it. I'm going to take it to, check, to checkers, make it easy for you. Checkers is my adversary playing against me. He is intended to, pre to prevent me from getting to the end of the board. In that process, he wants to take every chip I have. That's the game. And I'm going to do the same with him. What happens is when I lose a chip, unfortunately, I begin to cry of what I lost. And I become fearful. Which means I put my head in the sand and I, and I give up. If I stand back from the board and see the board through the Father's eyes, this is what will happen. He will show me where to put my hand on the chip because in front of that is a jump. I would have seen the jump if I kept rolling in my pity party. So he shows me a jump and when I make the jump, he tells me don't take my finger off the chip. Why is that? Why would he tell me not to take my finger off the chip? So I'm hoping there's another jump. I would not have seen the second jump unless I was obedient with the first. And by the time it's said and done, what would have taken me 10, 15 moves to get to, I'm able to get there really in one. Because he says, I'm going to show you how to move. When I get to the end of the board, what happens? What do I say? Sorry? I say, crown me. That's what I say. What do I get crowned with? Come on, it's a checklist. I made it easier for you. What do I get crowned with? Come on. What chip? What chip? His One of the ones that I lost. So in order for me to get crowned, I must lose something first. And when it is restored to me, I move totally different. Now I move as a king strategically all over the board. Why? Why does a king get to move different on the board? I see you don't know the answer. It's because he helps to usher others to their place of being crowned as well. And the Satan is always wondering where's the one who's crowned. In order to win this game, you gotta learn how to get in a position to be crowned. And it's gonna be with the very things you lost or that you thought you gave up. That's why he says, I restore to you the years that the cake of worms and the locusts ate up. The restoration is a new creation. Back to man. If you don't know how to play the game, you're going to get your blood handed to you. And in the end, he wants to take your life. Almost got me many times with the crowd I used to hang around and the things I used to do. Thank God for Jesus. Because I would have been dead or in prison. And now I'm here ready to go and play golf with my life and my daughter's going to ride in the car. Because he gave me a life. You get it? Is that yes? Yes. All right. Play the win. Nothing short of that. Rule, have dominion. Anything less than that, there's no satisfaction there. All right? My man. Thank you all. Thank you.